Bruchem Aboyim. Thank you so very much for coming. Welcome to our home. We are um, right before Pesach. And um, there'll be a double lecture today, which is unusual. Usually we do one, and then we do the Chumash part. Uh, we're going to do one lecture on Passover, and then we're going to do one quick lecture, a little shorter, on B'dikat Chomet, on uh, searching for the Chomets. And uh, again, we'll talk about that when we get to it. So, the lecture today is called The Last Passover. <laughs> wow. That's quite a title. The Last Passover. What exactly do I mean by that statement? You know, we know that nothing that is written in Tanakh, in the 24 books of the Torah, is without deeper meaning. You know, we just celebrated the holiday of Purim. The Megillah makes a point of listing the ten cents of Haman and that they were hung on the gallows that was meant for Mordechai. So what? It comes out that the three letters in their names, three of them are smaller than the rest of the letters as they list the ten names. They are the Toph, which has a numerical value of 400, the Shin, which has a numerical value of 300, and the Zion, which has a numerical value of 7. So these three letters together have a total of 707 is the total number. The number is important in that it connects with the 10 Nazi officers that were hung in Nuremberg. Two things stand out. First, they were hung in the Hebrew year 5707. They were originally scheduled to be hung in June of 1946, but the hangings were delayed until October 16, 1946. Had they been hung in June, it would have been the Hebrew year 5706, and said they were hung after the Jewish New Year, in the year 5707. Again, not an accident. Secondly, they were act there were actually 11 men who were to be hung that day. But one of the men, Reich Marshal Hermann Wilhelm Goring, committed suicide in his jail cell. Therefore, there were only 10 men that were actually hung at Nuremberg. Nothing is an accident. It's in the year 5707. We have been taught in the Sefer Yitzhira that the beginning is always wedged in the end. The Torah tells us about two Passovers that the children of Israel celebrated. The first was the night before they left Egypt as a free nation, and the second in the beginning of the second year in the desert. And that was the last time that the nation celebrated the holiday while they traveled in the desert. Not, I mean, this is very strange. Since on the level of Koratato, with gratitude, we are constantly thanking God for all the miracles that he performed for the nation in Egypt and at the sea. Also, you would, you would think that even without being commanded to do so, that the nation would have wanted to celebrate and commemorate their freedom from their oppressive slavery. Also, we see that those who could not partake of the first Passover in the desert, they complained to Moshe. They didn't want to be left out of the special mitzvah. So God recognized their sincerity and told Moshe to tell them there would be a second chance for them to fulfill the mitzvah one month later. The origin of what we call Pesach Sheni, a second Passover, a, a, a sort of do-over for those who could not or would not participate in the first Passover. A mitzvah that we still commemorate today. So, such enthusiasm in the first year, and yet, there's no mention anywhere in the Torah that the Jews complained to Moshe saying they wanted to celebrate the holiday of Passover again. Why not? So, there are different reasons given for not celebrating Passover again in the desert. One reason given is that for the 40 years that they traveled in the desert, they did not perform the mitzvah of circumcision on their newborn sons. The reason given for this was that they were never certain when they would be commanded to travel. And so they didn't want to circumcise their sons for fear that it could be dangerous or even life-threatening. So this problem created, this created a certain problem since the law states very clearly that no one can bring their Paschal offering if any male member of their household is not circumcised. This law included even a Gentile slave. So the only time that all the nation were circumcised was when they left Egypt and on that first Passover in the desert. 
And so by law, they would not have been able, they, that part, by law, that would have been the last time they could have celebrated the holiday in the desert. So how does that connect with Passover that we are about to celebrate? This pandemic was in full force last Passover. Basically, the whole world was on lockdown. And just like on the night of Passover in Egypt, where the nation was commanded to sequester themselves in their homes and not leave, so too, last Passover in Israel, the Israeli public were told to stay in their houses and not leave, just like with the first Passover. Death was lurking in the streets. We are now about to enter the second Passover, the last one that the children of Israel observed in the desert. As I mentioned before in my thoughts, all the predictions, all the prophecies about the coming of the Messiah are all here around us now, such as social disobedience, worldwide recession, lack of religiosity, moral depravity. The list goes on. The Lubavitcher Rebbe, of blessed memory, said before his passing that we are the last generation before the coming of the Messiah. He said that he had done all that he could do. Now, it was up to his chassidim, us, to finish the job. We also see that when Rebbe passed on, there was no one appointed to take over his position. He felt that there was no reason to groom a successor since our next leader will be the Messiah himself. The prophets tell us that when the Messiah will come, when will he come? When we give up hope. What does that mean, give up hope? When we have a strong leader at the helm, then even if we are in a powerful storm, we look up at him and we gain confidence and hope. However, now when we look at the bridge, there's no one at the wheel. We feel lost and deserted. In that moment, we give up any hope of being saved through natural means. So then, we turn our hearts and our voices to our Father in Heaven and pray that He will intercede and bring an end to all the negativity and evil in the world. He will hopefully answer our prayers and bring the Messiah now. Our rabbis tell us that when God will bring the final redemption, it will be accompanied with great and wondrous acts of salvation. The redemption will be so great that it will eclipse all the miracles that God performed in Egypt, based on the saying of our sages that all the festivals will be annulled in the future time, all except for Purim. The Alter Rebbe, the founder of Chabad Chassidah, said that the future revelation of divinity will be so intense that the revelation currently evinced by the festivals will be as insignificant as a midday candle. Purim, however, will be the exception because Purim's miracle was called forth by the, for a year-long self-sacrifice of the Jewish people of that time. They could have averted Haman's decree of annihilation by conversion. Their Messiris Nefesh, their willingness to give up their lives for God, evoked a divine reaction so sublime that even in the future time, it will never be nullified. That being the case, then this year's Passover would then be the last celebration commemorating the redemption of our ancestors from the oppressive slavery in Egypt. It will be replaced by a time of wonders and miracles that will far outshine anything that has happened before it. It does sound a bit far-fetched to say that all this could happen in a second. But, huh, think of the pandemic. If someone would have told you that 7.7 .7 billion people would be affected by the same threat at the exact same time, that the whole world would be shut down, <laughs> you would have said that person's crazy. But it did happen, and it's still happening. So what are we supposed to do? You know, there's a story written in Przanski's Haggadah called The Night of Amuna. It's a story about an individual, a poor innkeeper called Zanvil, who couldn't pay his rent. So Zanvil tried talking, begging the porridge to give him more time, as if it would have helped, to get the money to pay the porridge. He was out of options. His wife, a righteous woman, told him that 
distant down the road, was the shul of a of the Akta Rebbe, Rebbe Avram Yeshua Heschel of Akt, who's known as the Oev Yisrael, the lover of Israel. She told him that the Rebbe was giving his Shabbos Hagadol sermon that week, and that he should go and listen. He might there be something special maybe that the Rebbe might say that could help. He thought, what do you have to lose? So he went to the shul of the Abdur Rebbe for the special Shabbos sermon. The Rebbe began the sermon. He said there are two brachot, there are two blessings that refer to God as the Redeemer of Israel. One, Goel Yisrael, we say every day in the Amida and the prayer, look upon our affliction. And the other, Ga'al Yisrael, we say in the Passover Haggadah. What's the difference between the two? He answered that Ga'al Yisrael, that we say on the Pesach night, is in the past tense. After all, we are thanking God for redeeming us from the Egyptian bondage, which occurred many years ago to our ancestors. But the Goel Yisrael, that we say in the Amida, that is in the present tense, because we're asking God to save us from our daily troubles and difficulties. This prayer takes into account the constant miracles that God performs for us each and every day when we are in need. So Zamville thought, you know, these words were encouraging, but not particularly useful for his situation. So he began to walk away. But then the Abdur Rebbe caught his attention when he gave a mushal, an example to illustrate his point. He said, let's say that there's a man who lives in a faraway village. We'll call him Zanville. And let's say that the Porritz is threatening to throw him and his family out of his inn if he doesn't pay up all the rent that he owes. So what does Anvil do? The Rebbe paused. I'll tell you what he does. He cries out to Hashem to help him. But Nitzak el Hashem, as it states in the Passover Agoda, and the Jews cried out to Hashem in Egypt, and then the verse continues and says he heard their voice. Tonight, shouted the Rav, is the night of the Seder. It is a great time of godly con compassion, a time when God hears and accepts all our prayers. And I know of a special treasure, a skula, that was passed down to me, that when you reach the words in the Haggadah, the Nitzak el Hashem, and they cried out to God, you should cry out to God and pray with all of your heart for help with the specific and personal pain that you're experiencing. Someone who cries out at that moment is guaranteed that his voice will be heard by God Almighty. And just as the children of Israel were answered in Egypt on this very same night, so too will you be redeemed from all your troubles. <laughs> well, Zamvil couldn't get home fast enough. He told his wife as he came in that this year when we reached the words in the Haggadah, the whole family is going to scream out to God as loud as we can that he should save us from being evicted by the parts. And so it was. When they reached the place in the Haggadah, they all screamed at the top of their lungs. In fact, they screamed so loud they didn't hear the banging at their front door. Finally, when they quieted down, Zanville heard the banging at his door. He answered the door and standing there, was his Gentile neighbor. He held two sacks in his hands. He quickly placed them on the floor inside the door and told Zanville that he was being chased by the police. He told them that he knew that Zanville could be trusted, and so he was leaving the gold with him. He said that if he returned, then one sack would be Zanville's and the other would be his. If he didn't make it back, then both sacks would belong to Zanville. And with that, he was gone in the, into the night. The next morning, Zanville heard that his neighbor trying to make his escape had drowned in the river and was dead. Zanville's fortunes had changed overnight. He was now able to pay off the parts and live a comfortable life with his wife and children and even grandchildren. After Yontav went, 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 added, Zanville went to see the Abdur Rebbe to tell him what had happened. <laughs> the Rav agreed that clearly the words that he used were chosen by heaven for Zanville's benefit, but it was Zanville's own simple faith that brought his salvation about. 
crying out to God with pure belief that he will help, will bring all the blessings in the world. My friends, we too need to cry out to God. The blessing that was given to Yaakov, our father, was Kol, Kol Yaakov. The voice is the voice of Yaakov. This is something over and above prayer. See, prayers are written out, or at least articulated. We use, we try, we use words to try to convince God, change his mind, and do what we want. Kol, the voice is a deep cry for help. No words, neither written or spoken, just a cry for help from a child to their parent, a call that comes from deep within the child and reaches even deeper within the depths of the parent. God never stops listening. He never stops caring. There is only one constant in the world, and that is that God Almighty, our Father in Heaven, loves us all dearly. How is that possible? I mean, look around. We are far from model children. I mean, we haven't been good. We are negligent and disrespectful. We, we don't listen to all of requests or advice. That's true. But that doesn't change the fact that he is our father. The term father has nothing to do with whether we are good or bad. In fact, there are times that a parent will love a child that is unruly and rebellious even more than his other children who, so to speak, follow his words. The more that a child needs, the more a parent wants to give. God understands only too well that we are a challenged generation. We suffer from all types of disorders and handicaps. Though at times we may try to divorce ourselves from his presence, he understands and tries to bring us even closer. His love for us is not dependent on anything other than he is our Father. He created us, and there's nothing, nothing that we can do or say that can change that fact. We are told that the gates of prayer are many times closed, but the gates of tears are never closed. So this year, when we get to the part in Haggadah, the Nitzak El Hashem, cry out to God, and then this may well be the last Passover with the coming of Mashiach Sikane quickly and in our time. Thank you for listening to that lecture. What I'd like to do now is continue with the few words on Bedikat's Chamas. Tomorrow night we'll be searching for Chamas in our houses. So I'd like to talk about that just for a minute. The Talmud tells us that on the night of the 14th of the month of Nisan, we should search for chametz in our dwelling places by the light of a candle. There are many homiletical interpretations concerning this search. The gematria of the Hebrew word chametz is 138, and the gematria of the Hebrew word matzah is 135. The difference between the two of them is three. The number three may allude to that which changes matzah, to chametz. The number may allude to three specific character traits that, so to speak, sour the dough. As it states in Pirkei Avot, Rebelezer a copper said, Kina, Taiva, and Kavod. Envy, lust, and the desire for honor drive a man from this world. It is these three traits that make the dough, man's ego, rise. On this night, God expects us to search the depths of our souls and to remove even the slightest hint of chametz, ego. As we are told by our sages that God abhors anything that has an ego. In fact, the two things that were not allowed to be placed on the altar in the temple were leaven and honey, any type of fruit juice. Both of these substances causes things to rise. As the Talmud in the Sota 5a states, God says of an arrogant person, he and I cannot live in the world together. How do we do this? So we search with the light of a candle. As it's written in Mishle, Ner ki ner mitzvah, that a commandment is a candle, the Torah or, and the Torah is a light. 
So through the fulfillment of mitzvot, we can create a candle with which we can light with Torah. And then we can identify and remove the leaven, the ego, that resides within our hearts. You know, the gematria of the word matzah, as I mentioned before, is 135, which is the same gematria as the Hebrew word kala, meaning physical light. This is an allusion to the matzah, which is light in weight compared to the chametz, which is much heavier. This also is an allusion to the fact that one should live their life light and simple, unpretentious, much like matzah. Not bothering with all the additives and preservatives that just add more poisons and calories into our bodies. Many diseases can trace their origin back to obesity. Matzah alludes to a simple and healthy lifestyle, traveling light. In order for the matzah to not become chametz ferment, we work the dough constantly guarding that it doesn't rise. All of this must be done, must be done within 18 minutes. 18 is the gematria of the Hebrew word chai, life. The only way to live proper life properly is to keep working the dough, staying awake at the wheel. If we don't focus, then our eagle takes over and the dough rises, and we now have issues that we must deal with. So this year, let us look deep within our souls and try to do a proper bedika, a proper search for all the chametz that resides within our souls. Let us make a conscious effort to work on our ego, ego, edging God over. Let us do our spring cleaning properly so that we can create a dira betaktonu, a dwelling place for God in this lower world, in the depths of our hearts, a place where he can feel comfortable and where he doesn't have to worry about an eviction notice. I want to bless you all and thank you all for listening to the lecture and for all the lectures that you've listened to. Um, teaching without students is uh, not teaching. Uh, the greatest uh, joy that a teacher has is to teach. And I thank you for that privilege and honor. And I bless you all with a sweet, happy, fulfilling Akasha Pesach. And again, may this be the last Passover with the coming of Mashiach Sakenu quickly in our time. Thank you so very much for everything.